time to reflect. It is our duty as a democracy to reflect on the injustices which have been committed in our society and to ensure that they will never happen again. On the 13th of January this year, the Irish Prime Minister, or Taoiseach Micheál Martin, made a statement following the final report of the Commission of Investigation into Mother and Baby Homes and Certain Related Matters. This Commission of Investigation was established in 2015 by the Irish Government to provide a full account of what happened to sadly thousands of women and children in these homes during the period from, 1920, from 1922 to 1998. Newham, located in the west of Ireland, was one of these homes and probably today the most infamous, where against the backdrop of a socially conservative and unforgiving society, unmarried mothers who fell pregnant were sent to give birth. Afterwards, they were often separated from their babies with little hope of ever being reunited. In his statement earlier this year, Taoiseach Micheál Martin, on behalf of the Irish government, the Irish state and its citizens, apologised for the profound generational wrong visited upon Irish mothers and their children who ended up in mother and baby institutions and county homes. To quote, Taoiseach Micheál Martin said, I apologise for the shame and stigma which they were subjected to and which for some remains a burden to this day. In apologising, I want to emphasise that each of you were in an institution because of the wrongs of others. Each of you is blameless. Each of you did nothing wrong and has nothing to be ashamed of. It is my view that shame was a key factor in Irish society in the 20th century. Giving birth outside of marriage could bring shame on the entire family. Unmarried mothers and their children were stigmatised and often ostracised and institutionalised to be punished and more importantly, to be kept separate from and unseen by the rest of society. We have a long way to go in making amends for the evils that were visited upon the residents of these homes and their survivors. The Irish government accepts and will respond to all recommendations made by the Commission and its response will centre on four main pillars, recognition, remembrance, records, and finally, restorative recognition. Apart from the state actions which seek to make amends for these atrocities, there are several incredible survivor-led or collaborative academic NGO initiatives which seek to empower the survivors of these institutions, such as the Chu Moral History Project. This project aims to give survivors and their families the voice to tell their own stories in their own words, to create a complete and accessible and a permanent archive of their experiences and to work with survivors to provide an artistic response to their stories. By collaborating directly with the survivors themselves, they reassert their dignity following the wrongs that were visited upon them in the last century. Earlier, I spoke of the sense of shame that these fallen, unmarried mothers and their children were subjected to. In my view, when you listen to the oral histories of the survivors, some of which are already available as part of the Tomb Oral History Project as the podcast Other Stories from the Tomb Mother and Baby Home. I do not hear shame. I hear the courageous accounts of survivors who have suffered greatly, but are who, who are committed to sharing their testimonies, taking ownership of the narrative and of their own experiences. The Tomb Oral History Project picks up the fallen women and children and supports them with dignity and respect as they continue to search for answers and for recognition. It is therefore my pleasure to introduce our three guest speakers today from NUIG Galway. First, um, first of all speaking, we'll have John, who I will introduce last. So please let me introduce Dr. Sarah Ann Buckley, who is one of the lead researchers on the Two Moral History Project. Sarah Ann is a lecturer of history at the College of Arts, Social Science and Celtic Studies at NUIG, working in the field of modern Irish social history particularly in the fields of Irish gender history and the history of childhood and child welfare. She is one of the foremost historians working on childhood in Ireland and gender history since her 2013 monograph, The Cruelty Man, Child Welfare, the NSPCC and the State of Ireland, 1889 to 1956. Her work has advanced the history of child welfare, poverty, gender and class in modern Ireland and made a significant contribution to the field nationally and internationally. 
We also have Dr. Miriam Hutton, a lecturer at the School of Humanities at NUIG. Miriam joined Drama and Theatre Studies at NUIG in 2014 and currently serves as the Vice President of the Irish Society for Theatre Research. Her research interests include 20th and 21st century theatre and performance, production and performance ecologies, the politics of performance, feminisms, trauma and memory, memory studies. Miriam's recent monograph, Staging Trauma, Bodies in Shadow, considers how performance and production ecologies in Ireland and the UK capture women-centred traumatic histories through staging, performance and production encounters. Um, this spring, Miriam will direct and produce the Tomb Oral History Theatre production with Drama and Theatre Studies, collaborating with staff and students throughout the university, which we will hear more of shortly. And finally, let me pass the word to Dr. John Cunningham, who is, as, as mentioned previously, is one of the lead or co-PIs in the Tomb Oral History Project. John is a, John, Dr. John Cunningham is a lecturer of the Department of History and NG NUIG and is the former editor of SEHER, the Journal of Irish Labour History. John's research interests include Irish local history, the moral economy and global syndicalism. He is the co-director of the Irish Centre for, I for the Histories of Labour and Class and he is currently completing a biography of Tom Glynn, a Galway-born labour radical in South Africa and Australia. Thank you all for your attention and I'm very glad now to pass the word on to the experts. Thank you. Take it away, John. <clears throat> yeah, okay. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Jill. And um, <clears throat> excuse me, I should wish everybody a happy St. Patrick's Day, I suppose. And um, th um, I'm um, privileged uh, to be speaking at this, um, uh, at this event. Now, the Chewham Oral History Project arises from a public scandal about the historic treatment of mothers, mostly unmarried, and their children in institutions known as mother and baby homes. Chewham, uh, as, uh, <clears throat> as has been said already, is a small town in the west of Ireland near our University of Galway. If it was where the public scandal was uh, at, its more, at its most scandalous, as it were, the scandal concerned the whole of the Irish state. For our panel, I'll be providing historical context. Sarah Ann Buckley will deal with the scandal and the commission of inquiry resulting from it. And Miriam Halton will discuss a production which engages with testimony from our oral history project that she's preparing with her drama students. Uh, the presentations <coughs> will engage only tangentially with the oral history project, but we hope to be able to report on progress in the uh, questions and answers. Now, mother and baby homes uh, were established mainly under the control of religious in the early 1920s, part of the process under which the new Irish state secured a substantial degree of independence from Britain. They didn't come from nowhere, of course. Rather, they represented an adaptation of a pre-existing welfare system established by the British state in Ireland. Ireland had been a majority Catholic part of a United Kingdom that was officially Protestant, Episcopalian. In order to manage religio-political differences in Ireland, the state established broadly secular educational and welfare systems in the 1830s. A major uh, element of the Irish story of the following 90 years was how Cat the Catholic Church colonised these public institutions in a way. It did so through a process of triangulation or something like it, by pressurising Irish nationalist parliamentarians to promote its agenda in Parliament on the one hand, and by persuading British governments that it was a bulwark against radical and redistributionist political separatists on the other. The welfare system of the 1830s was a carceral system based on large residential workhouses. Uh, you see the example of, the, uh, of one of them there in a, 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 in a photograph, and you can see the drawing in the next slide uh, when we move to that uh, uh, now. Um, uh, so the, uh, so um, these, catered, um, these institutions catered uh, for uh, several categories of impoverished people, the, peop um, the elderly, people with intellectual disabilities, and also single mothers and their children. 
The system evolved and other services were developed, but the workhouses underutilized as they were, um, <coughs> Uh, uh, remained the key exemplar of welfare and uh, public health uh, in the later into the early 20th century. Reform proposals emerged, informed by new thinking about welfare. And um, if we can, we can move on to the next slide. I think um, notable among these um, <coughs> uh, uh, um, initiatives was a government, um, it was, it was the um, a Vice Regal Commission on Poor Law Reform in 1906. It recommended that workhouses be closed and that they be replaced by separate institutions for, and I quote, the various classes of inmates. Ominously, it proposed that, uh, and I quote, and the quotes there in front of you, unmarried mothers should be uh, sent to institutions under religious or philanthropic management or to labour houses and be kept apart from other classes. There's a clear anathemization there, which would become even more uh, pronounced as Jill suggested over time. So that was 1906 and many great uh, discussions ensued, but little was done in practice in the following uh, decade or so. This was largely because workhouses had become tied up with local patronage and with local politics. There was resistance then to any measure that would disturb the contracts of those benefiting economically from the system. For Sinn Féin and for other oppositional movements um, in the early 20th century, the poor law became a byword for waste and corruption. And when the Revolutionary Separatist Parliament, Thal Aaron, uh, was founded by Sinn Féin in 1919, its democratic programme uh, promised to end, and we can uh, see the full quote in the next slide, the present odious, degrading and foreign poor law system, substituting therefore a sympathetic native scheme for the care of the nation's aged and infirm. Um, local authorities, um, those supportive of the revolutionary doll, set about giving effect to this commitment, with Cork City very much to the fore. In the circumstances, though, reform was challenging. Funding from the British state dried up, and with the breakdown of law and order in the country, it was difficult to collect the local taxation on which welfare facilities depended. There was no possibility of constructing new buildings so the grim Victorian workhouses were used. With religious congregations already present in most of the institutions and a disposition within Sinn Féin to defer to the Catholic Church, it is not surprising that that church strengthened its position in the new order of things. What emerged would be far from the sympathetic native scheme promised in the, in the democratic programme. For single mothers and their children, it was an improvised and ad hoc system that emerged in the 1920s. Many of them were maintained in county homes, essentially relabeled workhouses, which also catered to others, including the elderly. And with regard to the dedicated facilities, what we're calling mother and baby homes, because this is how they've been categorized officially, uh, though they had different names um, in different places and at different times. But these were publicly funded, but operated mainly by Catholic religious, though a small number were Protestant. Uh, contractual and reporting relationships varied from one to the other. Three of the larger and best known of the homes were operated by the Sisters of the Sacred Heart, an English-based order invited uh, into Ireland by the Free State Government in 1922, just as the British military were leaving. Our project concerns the Chua Mother and Baby Home, currently the most notorious of the institutions, so I'll talk um, a little bit about its foundation. Sorry, I'll take time for a little drop of water. So this is specific to Chua, but it gives an insight into the wider pattern. 
It arose from Galway County Council's uh, decision of September 1921 to close the county's 10 workhouses and to repurpose a few of them. The workhouse building in Glenamaddy, uh, there's a photograph in the next slide uh, from there, um, was, was a, a building which had been partly uh, <clears throat> destroyed during the War of Independence. It was designated a home for, uh, and I quote, orphaned, abandoned, neglected children and unmarried mothers. And it was placed um, under the management of the Bon Secours sisters who had previously been employed as nurses in the workhouse there. The partly burned building was a poor choice, a poor choice and high mortality uh, there drew attention to its unsuitability. For that reason, the mother and baby home was soon moved to the Chum workhouse, where it became responsible for uh, County Mayo as well as County Galway. On the 2nd of June 1925, 87 children, 26 mothers and their bon secours custodians were conveyed to Chum by ambulance and motor car. Having served as a barracks for both British and Irish armies during the previous um, few years, the building was not much better than the one it replaced. In Glenamaddy, uh, the Bon Secours sisters had been employees of the Galway County Council, but this changed in Chewham, where they were paid a fee for each child and mother in their custody. They remained answerable to public authorities, in particular to the health committee of the local government body which owned the workhouse building. But it's clear that regulation was very light touch and that while the authorities were aware of gross deficiencies in the education of the children there and in extraordinarily high mortality rates, they did not intervene to any great extent. The impression is that there was greater scrutiny of the boarding out system, so called, which placed children with families uh, from roughly the age of seven in the case of Chewham. As for the religious, their behaviour indicates uh, that they did not um, consider that regulations, including the law of the land, applied to themselves at all. This is most starkly evident in relation to their cavalier approach to registering the births and deaths of those in their custody. At the same time, there was great social pressure on women who became pregnant outside marriage to submit themselves to an institution and to surrender their child for adoption. Priests, doctors and nuns were at the sharp edge in setting social norms in this regard. The institution in Chewham closed in 1961, part of a dispute disagreement about renovations, but the system continue, continued. Indeed, the last of the mother and baby homes didn't close until the 1990s. However, they played an ever diminishing role in Irish society after the introduction of the unmarried mother's allowance in 1973, reduced uh, the financial pressure on, um, on expectant uh, single mothers. So I'll uh, leave um, it at that and I'll hand over uh, to uh, Sarah Ann Buckley. Thanks very much, John. Am I okay to jump in, Jill? <laughs> yeah. Um, Laura, Please if you could move Sarah, on the yeah. next. Yeah. So this is just um, uh, actually just the previous slide, Laura, just briefly, um, as John said, we're not going to talk a lot about the project in the presentation, but in the questions, we're really happy to discuss. Um, this is our website and uh, just the, the different people that are working on the project and um, three of the survivors from the project, Christine, Peter and Teresa, um, who are part of a podcast that uh, we produced last year and and I think is, is quite a powerful uh, piece of listening for people. Um, so first of all, just to, to thank Laura and everyone in Irish Studies in Brazil and to thank Jill and the uh, consulate and the embassy and to say thank you also to the students who are hopefully uh, watching and, and listening in. Um, so if you could move on, Laura. What I'm going to speak about today primarily, um, John has set the scene for what were the mother and baby homes. So what I'm going to talk about is um, 
basically why was the commission set up in 2015 um, and what institutions did they look at and then I'm going to spend some time talking about the sources that were looked at and this question of blame when it comes to society and also to the the families involved and, and often the women themselves. So the Commission of Inquiry into Mother and Baby Homes and Related Matters was set up in 2015, but it was really because of the work of a historian, Catherine Corliss from Tum, um, and she had looked and and basically ordered and gotten all the the death certificates uh, for the infants, which at that point was uh, the 796. And she really had done this research two years previous, but she had been trying to get attention um, nationally initially. And Alison O'Reilly uh, uh, worked with her, a journalist, and then it really did become this international uh, story. And the commission itself uh, was to report earlier, but reported in, in January 2020. And if you could move to the next slide, Lara, one of the really important things for historians and for survivors was what are the terms of reference? What would the commission look at? And we have had a number of commissions in Ireland. Um, you have obviously, uh, because of Elaine's work, heard of the Magdalene Laundries, the Industrial Schools and Reformatory Schools. So we've had different commissions of investigation. So it became clear that this would look at 18 institutions, 14 of which were so-called mother and baby homes, and four of which were county homes. And while it would look tangentially at boarding out, children at nurse and adoption, that wouldn't be the focus of the commission. And that's quite important and I'll come back to it at the end. Um, so just on the next slide, I have the list of institutions. And what you'll see is that uh, the Bon Secure's mother and baby home or the, the Tume home is uh, number five on the list. Now, when it came to the county homes, as John has said, only four were looked at, okay? And that's quite relevant because there were another uh, 20 plus county homes that could have been included. So what we're getting is really a fraction of those that were actually in operation. And the next slide will give us the numbers. And this is from the commission's report. So about 56,000 unmarried mothers and 57,000 unmarried children were in the 18 institutions. But as I said, this is a much larger figure if we took into account all of the county homes. And it's also a much larger figure if we took in the other institutions that were not included, okay? So some of the, the points that I think are quite relevant to us, um, most of those that were, were recorded were the, the unmarried mothers were between 12 and 40 years of age. Interestingly, 11.4% were under the age of 18 years, um, some as young as 12, but there does not seem to have been uh, much of an investigation or records available to see if there was any reports of, of sexual abuse or of how those younger women became pregnant. And very critically, the commission reported that while it was not a peculiarly Irish phenomenon, the proportion of Irish unmarried mothers who were admitted to mother and baby homes or county homes in the 20th century was probably the highest in the world. So I often um, say to my students, we, we need to look at all. There's many countries that are having investigations into these institutions, but as existing research has shown, um, Owen O'Sullivan and Ian O'Donnell actually recorded that in the 1950s in Ireland, up to 1% of the population was institutionalized. So it is a very Irish phenomenon that's coming from the 19th century to use these institutions. So in the next slide, I'll just look briefly at the question of blame. And this is quite interesting because um, Jill referred to the apology from the Taoiseach and uh, very much um, the argument from the Commission's report is that it was a, a shared blame or a societal blame. So I have some extracts here 
um, responsibility for that heart treatment rests mainly with the fathers of their children and their own immediate families. And also this, this second quotation, which states that uh, women were admitted because they failed to secure the support of their family and the father of their child. So in the executive summary, there is quite an emphasis on that point and, and the language used is very much women did not gain the support, fathers did not support the women, families did not support them. So it's a slightly different narrative than we would perhaps in, in our research have looked at when it comes to, to church and state and, and that question of, of social control. Um, the testimonies, if I, if I, when the, the next slide is up, um, one of the reasons we wanted to pursue the oral history project was uh, we had spoken to a number of survivors who had asked that, you know, they, they wanted to make sure that their story was recorded in, in their own words and with some control. Um, so that is very much why the oral history project is important to us. Um, the confidential committee, uh, 550 um, people went to the confidential committee to give their testimony and um, right now those tapes have been recovered and will hopefully be, be given to survivors who, who ask for them. But what they show, even within the Commission's report, is that there are accounts of abuse, of rape, of incest. There's definitely a lack of sex education. And there's also a big question that a lot of those that were placed in institutions and a lot of the survivors were, were connected to a number of institutions. Um, and I think that's really key for us, that this became an intergenerational and a lifelong uh, story. As John pointed out, many show that there was a priest or a religious person involved in their placement. And we very much see a patriarchal and a class-based system. Um, there was a line there that I've put in that the commission was concerned uh, about what they stated was contamination of evidence and that some witnesses gave evidence that was incorrect. When we are looking at oral histories and at memory, and this may be something more for the questions, but um, I think that question of correct and incorrect is, is something we should tease out a, a bit more. And just before um, I, I conclude in the next slide, I have two examples from the confidential committee, and I've chosen these um, the first because we see that uh, the woman that, that actually came and, and gave her story, she had been boarded out and then at the age of 12 was sent to an industrial school because of abuse. So we have at this point now three different institutions of the state, a, a mother and baby institution, a boarding out system, and then an industrial school. So I think that shows that question of different connections between institutions. And uh, the second story for me is, is very much about this patriarchal system and the fact again that uh, the woman who gave her evidence, um, there was intergenerational trauma and the case really shows that um, we need to deal as a society with these stories in a, in a very delicate manner, I think. So, as I say, the oral history project is very important to us because survivors have control over their story. They can change it, they can remove it. But just in the final slide, I guess I'd like to discuss where to now for the Irish state, for survivors, for academics and for advocates. And their, the task, and this is a quote from, from the commission's introduction, uh, the task of any commission is to investigate the matters set out in its terms of reference. And in the last line, we see the conclusions it reaches may not always accord with the prevailing narrative. And I think in some ways, the reaction to the Commission's report has been that it has not accorded the prevailing narrative, or at least not how many survivors have experienced their time in institutions. So I think that, it, you know, as academics and as students and, uh, you know, as advocates, we do need to look at the report, we need to interrogate it, and then we need to use other 
um, sources like this oral history project to build that longer narrative. So I'm going to pass you, I believe, to Miriam, um, who's going to talk more about the the uh, drama side of the project. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sarah. And um, now, should I try and share my screen or I don't know, does Lara, you're on mute there. I can't hear you. Yes, if you if you want to share it, present now. If not, Victor has already prepared it in case you cannot <laughs> show it. So I'm wondering, can you see a video? Uh, the video, would you like me to show the video first? Yeah, so if you could prep the video, should I stop sharing? Did uh, it not? No, you you are there already. No, uh, so, I have oh, it here. Okay, I think it's best to let you share it, but I'll just um, preface it before right. saying this is a video of three of the drama students and um, creating a dance sequence, and it's only three days rehearsal, <laughs> so it's not final. It's test footage. We're exploring ideas. It's very messy. We had to spend the first month of rehearsals online because of COVID. Um, and then we eventually got permission to come into campus, but we're wearing our face masks. We're rehearsing outside in the Irish weather, <laughs> two meters apart. Um, and so what the students did, they, there's going to be 10 performers in the final piece, but now you're just seeing three. And they're each working with a chair, but in the final piece, they're going to be working with a baby cot. We're building cots. We've put in an order for timber and our technical manager is going to build them. And so there's going to be 10 cots around three meters apart and each student has their own performance space. And then we'll have a well-known Irish musician called Colm McAnumara. He's agreed to perform in the video with us and um, assuming we can get the dates right. So at the moment, what you see is a very messy start. You see me running <laughs> out of the shot because I had to leave down my phone. I forgot to bring in a speaker um, and it's a bit stop start, but it, it's a way to open up and show you how the students are responding to the testimonies, which are quite traumatic. So I think, um, Laura, if you're happy to roll it there, we might take a quick look at that video and then Perfect. I'll move into the presentation. I will. I will. Uh, so let me open the, the screen and uh, then it is here. Let me see. Can you see it? Not, not yet. Not yet. Okay, compartilhar. I forgot to share it. So now, can you see it now? Yes, we can see a little bit, but not the full okay. screen. I will put it like this. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. And so now I'll run it.
mm-hmm. and let me get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that's just a bit of, um, I suppose, exploration from about three days in the rehearsal room. And as I said, there'll be 10 performers, but that was three. And I suppose the key set is that those green chairs will be replaced by cots um, and hopefully we'll have the musician with us. So if I can just go in to um, the PowerPoint. Do you have that, Lara? So I suppose what we're trying to do is to look at different arts methodologies for engaging with memory and with trauma and with oral history. Um, So if I can just move on to the next slide there, uh, Victor. So that's just a little joke for myself to remind myself, this is not a traditional theatrical process. Uh, We would normally begin rehearsing in January and work over a 12 week period and then end with a live performance with a live audience. (laughs) So COVID (laughs) has tested everything, but we decided this is very much a time critical history and the survivors are of an elderly age. We didn't feel we could afford to delay this and say we'll do it next year or the year after. And because of the recent publication of the commission report, there is a national consciousness emerging about this institution, which has moved from this is the latest part of an institutional history to what happened in mother and baby homes, as they were known very specifically. And people are talking about it and people are talking about it in a more nuanced way than we've seen previously because we're getting access to a lot more expertise and various perspectives um, and survivor testimony. So it feels like quite a new chapter in how we're dealing with the past and it feels like the right time to um, create an artistic piece um, that isn't a reenactment of testimony. We've decided not to do a reenactment, but is an engagement. Um, And there's a key focus on the intergenerational aspect in terms of what happened to the survivors and in terms of the university students now. Uh, So, Victor, if I can ask you to move on to the next slide for me. They're going to call the piece Nukta, which is Irish for unveiled, um, as they told me, and I'm ashamed my Irish isn't much better. So, as I said, originally conceived as a live performance with a live audience, but we know that isn't happening. Um, The original intention was to perform on different sites around campus. So it was always supposed to be largely an outside performance. We had ideas about dance and movement outside and very much to try and contrast the idea of this history as being hidden and being behind institutional walls and in dark spaces and something we don't talk about. And instead, with the next generation, we present it outside in daylight because it was going to be performed in May. And when you're being creative, you allow yourself to believe the weather will be good, even though you know it won't. But, you know, people will get over it for an hour. (laughs) Um, And so the idea to very much centralise the history in the university, which is a site of power and a site of privilege and a site of knowledge. And so that we're opening up the structures of the university and the education, that we're creating an intergenerational dialogue between survivors, students and wider family and friends, and that we're taking a look at different ways of presenting history and engaging with history. So that's the, um, I suppose, the research framework and the pedagogical framework as well. And the students want to explore a mix of ways. So there will be some theatrical encounters based on Um, anecdotes and memories that are in the testimonies. So we are going to act them out, but we're not going to have them very specific to each testimony. And so there will be a specific link to the testimonies, but without centralizing one person over another. Um, And there's a lot of dance and performance art because it feels like a very embodied trauma, like it's something people know, but a lot of the time we weren't allowed to talk about it as a society or people didn't feel they could or they couldn't articulate it or the classic idea with trauma is that language doesn't do it. It just, you can't articulate something and your brain, your memory, your cognitive functions can't digest it. It becomes overpowering. And so instead you get feelings and flashes and emotions. And sometimes it feels more truthful to express that in an embodied way than trying to capture it in, in any kind of linear narrative with the beginning, middle and end because we're really, are we at the beginning of this history or the middle or the end? It's hard to know. So we don't want to have to put that 
traditional storytelling framework on it because we don't think it really matches up. And um, there's also a suggestion, the idea we don't want to reenact a lot of the testimonies. There's a lot of violence in them, sometimes explicitly and sometimes it's signaled. And so we need to be careful not to trigger anything for anyone, whether the survivor themselves or even the students or even someone watching it. You never know what people have been through. And we think the purpose of the cultural engagement and the creative engagement is to open up the history and to get talking, not to try and shock and traumatize people to, to shut it down. Um, and there will also, in the final piece, which we're filming now, and um, there'll be interviews with the uh, experts, such as the historian, Sarah Ann and John, also the archivist, Dr. Barry Houlihan, and perhaps some others. And so they'll bring in aspects of, I suppose, the real uh, and testimonial and historical record, and, and that'll help link it together. And at the moment, we're going to film it on campus, but every week, COVID gives me a new challenge. Um, Victor, if we could move on to the next slide. Um, so this is just another aspect of how we're approaching it. This is a poem written by one of our PhD students, who's always a also a playwright. So one of the students is going to record this with voice, and then we're going to use different imagery. So it'll act as a voiceover. But I think it's quite a powerful response. I'll read it out somewhat quickly. Uh, we, the only ones who heard it all, witnesses to first drafts, second drafts, bin drafts, burnt drafts, false drafts, soon to be lost drafts. Silently and dutifully, we drank it all in, waiting. Mostly cheap like tissue, sometimes fine like parchment. Beautiful penmanship belying the filth, impatient scrawls across our breasts, always in poison ink. We did not mind the scratchy fountain pens and biros, the sweaty hands and smoky rooms, the tea stains from china cups, sickening polished wood in the offices and parlors of the great and the good. Later typewriters, each letter a violent slap of metal on ribbon, each name a precious soul worth every painful imprint. Now the words are on screens or in the air. You can't touch them and you can't touch us, not now. Our yellowing leaves redacted, torn, scribbled upon, foul mouths silence us once more. The stench is the same, unmistakable 100 years on. Can you smell it? When we were first written, nobody knew we existed or the secrets we hold. Do not ask forgiveness of your daughters and or their daughters. When Kuga Nomino is told, because you know we are silent, sealed. So that's just an example of some of the kind of content people are creating and responding to, because everyone, I think, feels quite emotional, I suppose, by the revelations that keep coming. Um, and a lot of people are responding in different ways. So that's just another uh, example of the work we're using. Uh, Victor, if I can move us on to the next slide. Um, so just some wider pedagogical considerations of working with young people. The students we're working with um, were all born after 2000. And they have very different memories and engagement with Irish history. So they didn't grow up you know, in the 90s when the revelations started to come out about industrial schools and then the Ryan report and all that. They, they didn't grow up watching that on the news every night. And um, at the moment, and I, I'm happy to be corrected on this, but I don't believe there is second level curriculum that engages with mother and baby institutions yet, though I hope that might be something that changes. So this isn't a history they will have been taught at school before they came to university. Part of the process initially, the students were going to go to Tume, see the site and meet with the survivors. And that's all really important, but of course, none of that can happen. Um, and so the question we're asking ourselves is, can we respond truthfully and artistically, but without triggering trauma? So we don't want them to think we're toning down what happened to them, but at the same time, the purpose of this creative engagement is to engage, is the intergenerational conversation and is to open up um, the Chew Moral History Project or historical institution, not to, to close it down. Um, and so we, we created a set of rehearsal guidelines about dealing with the difficulties that arise as we learn different areas of the past that are very complicated and very difficult. Um, I don't know if I have another slide, Victor, actually, or is that the last one? Oh, yes. Yeah, so just some general frameworks that I would be thinking of uh, in a wider context and my own research. Emily Pine, I think, has a useful statement on Irish remembrance culture six the ninth, since the 90s, when a lot of these reports began to emerge. She says, we are not who we thought we were, or put another way, we remember ourselves differently now. 
And so that's kind of, for me, captures a lot of what's happening when we think about nationhood and history and identity. And Kathy Carruth, obviously one of the leading theorists on trauma, she says, if Freud turns to literature to describe traumatic experience, it's because literature, like psychoanalysis, is interested in the complex relation between knowing and not knowing. And that's exactly what we're trying to do with our creative response. We're in that space. We're not saying it's this and we're not saying it's that. We're exploring this real difficult area in between and just trying to articulate a response with the tools that we have. And again, Jean-Francois Leotard talks about art and the aporia of art and its pain. It does not say the unsayable, but says that it cannot say it. So again, sometimes that kind of thinking gives us comfort. We're not here to make a conclusion. We're not here to make a judgment. We're not here to make statements. We're here to engage and ask questions and respond artistically and ethically um, and to become, I think, a point of conversation among different communities. Um, so I'll, I'll conclude on that because I think I've taken up a fair bit of time and uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much, Miriam, John and Sarah Ann. I leave uh, to Jill uh, to uh, try to round up and bring her question. And just to say that um, we hope that uh, this project that we started with Miriam trying to um, make um, the project come together uh, for to to continue working together with USPI and Galway University that it comes through after the pandemic because this is the spark uh, of uh, of a future um, network that we are trying to build up. So I leave to Jill because we have uh, Maria Silvia as moderator and also Aline. Excellent. Thank you, Lara. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I won't take up too much more of anybody's time before we go to uh, Maria Silva and Alini. Um, but I just wanted to thank each of the speakers for, for what was an extremely insightful presentation um, and, and really powerful, I think, artistic representations of, of the work that the project is doing. I absolutely loved the sneak peek of um, the production. I have to say, I feel envious of the thought of being cold practicing something outside in Ireland. It's it's a concept that is uh, quite far away from from us here in Brazil, but particularly the poem sealed by uh, by Sheila Anne Godfrey was a really really powerful piece that I imagine every everybody else who's who's on this call will um, will take home with them and and we'll reflect on it further on today. I just see one question that was put onto the chat in YouTube. Um, I don't know if any of the speakers would would have any ideas of any literary representations of the mother and baby homes um, and, and to what extent those representations read through the lens of trauma, trauma theory. I don't know if any of our three speakers would like to take um, that. There, there was, there's an account called Light in the Window um, by June Goulding, who was a nurse in the Besborough Mother and Baby Home, which I think is kind of important um, because it was one of the earliest accounts we had. And it really, when June published that, you know, she actually, I think um, herself took a lot of criticism, but um, we can see now that a lot of what she's discussed uh, in that um, has come through the report, particularly when women were giving birth, that no uh, painkillers were given and a lot of the, the the issues there. So I would recommend June Goulding, Light in the Window. Um, um, yeah, yeah, I can, Miriam. nothing on mother and baby institutions come to mind, but I think people might be more willing to share their work in the coming months and years. So Sarah Ann's right about artists being very nervous. So. The, the one that people know most well is the Eclipsed, which is about the Magdalene Laundry in Galway, not the Mother and Baby Institution by Patricia Burke Rogan. But after that premiered, she got death threats and they had to have a Garda at her door. You know, so it, it wasn't welcome knowledge and that was the 90s. And it even went to the Edinburgh Festival and won an award. But even though it was critically acclaimed socially, the work hadn't been done in the cultural consciousness or the political consciousness and it wasn't welcomed. And then you have more performance-based responses. So Broken Talkers would be um, a performance-based company where they focused on responding to the Artane Industrial School in a performance called The Blue Boy in 2011. So they'll have a video of it, but it's not, I think, 
accessible online, but if people contact them, then a new productions did laundry and that became very well known. That was site specific. So they used the last functioning Magdalen laundry that was in Dublin's north inner city, the, the Gloucester Street laundry was called then. I think it's Sean McDermott Street now. And so they responded to testimony from the Justice for Magdalene's uh, archive and then created pieces in response to those testimony. And so again, they have a video of that, but it's not left online freely. And um, so then of course there was Mary Raftery, no, um, no Escape, the Abbey Theatre did the, the Darkest Corner series. But I think a lot of people actually felt it was too much. And so everyone wanted to support the idea behind it, but I heard of people feeling like they couldn't watch it, which is something I'm very conscious of. So that was a response to the Ryan report. And I believe tomorrow for St. Patrick's Day, the Abbey is doing something more specific called Home. Um, and that I think is a response to the commission or to testimonies given to the commission. So that will be online tomorrow night from the Abbey Theatre website. So there's been a huge shift in terms of political and cultural reception. So when Patricia Burke Brogan did her piece on the Magdalene Laundry, culture and society and politics well, hadn't caught up with her. And now I think there's going to be an outpouring, um, but not, not as much on both mother and baby institutions specifically. And I think the last few months listening to the news in Ireland has um, again, fundamentally changed our perception of, of history, I think. I, I should say one or two, a few survivors have also written there. So Derek Leinster from the Bethany Home, which was a, a Protestant mother and baby home, has published two books. Um, Alison O'Reilly has written My Name is Bridget, which is a uh, uh, Anna Corrigan and her family story, again, the Tume Institution. Um, and uh, I, 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 I am, John, um, I would be leaving out people, <laughs> but survivors have been writing some of their, their memoirs as well over the last 10, 20 years. And um, I suppose when it comes to institutions more generally, I would always recommend Founded on Fear, which uh, uh, is the story of Peter Tyrrell, which he wrote in the 50s and 60s before he 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 actually commits suicide but the manuscript was found by historian Dermot Whelan um and the manuscript was found in the Sheehy Skeffington papers because he had been writing to Owen Sheehy Skeffington and sending chapter by chapter so that to me is probably one of the most powerful um accounts uh, I've ever read of any any institution in Ireland because he had also been in a in a POW camp during the Second World War, but he said the uh, letter frack industrial school was worse. So uh, and I think it's a really powerful account. So there have been survivors always trying to tell their stories, but trying to get a publisher. Um, and even when it came to Mavis Arnold, when she was trying to write um, the the story of the the thirty five. Um, girls who died in Cavan Orphanage, she could only get a publisher from Belfast at that time. She couldn't get one in, in the Republic of Ireland. So as Miriam said, um, there, we, we're seeing more publications because we're also seeing more publishers. <laughs> no, I think that they're fantastic recommendations and, and lots of homework for us all to do after yeah. after this wonderful event. Um, and yeah. just for myself personally, I think um, as as an event that we that we do on on St Patrick's Day and where we mark Irish culture, I think it was, was such a worthwhile discussion about what's hopefully sounds to be a true moment where the tide is turning on on this highly important topic for Irish society. And when we think about the, um, as Miriam was saying, the kind of reception of our own um, our own nationalism and our own understanding of our collective identity. I think um, this is a, an extremely powerful discussion that I'm sure that everybody has um, has really taken a lot of value from. I'll pass us immediately now on to Maria Silva, not to take up any more time. Um, Maria Silva, who's a, a researcher here at USP and who focuses on, on theatre studies um, and different topics like modern and contemporary North American and also Brazilian theatre and, and the comparative dramaturgy between the two. I pass the word on to you, Maria Silva, and thank you so much to each of the panelists so far. Thank you very much. Uh, can you see and hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, first of all, I have to say that it's a pleasure to be here. I'm really privileged and honored with the invitation by the chair, Jill and Laura. And well, I have to, to say something first. Uh, this is my first contact with the project uh, with the, well, uh, trauma history uh, and research. And I was really fascinated to get in touch with the, the projects and, and with the reports by Professor uh, Cunningham, by uh, G with uh, Miriam and Sarah too. Uh, because while you were uh, speaking and presenting, uh, lots of aspects came to my mind as points of uh, well, contact, uh, particularly uh, as concerns performances of theater plays related to uh, similar institutions here uh, in Brazil. Uh, rather than asking uh, conventional questions, I'll just mention the aspects uh, that were, well, the most um, uh, thought provoking from my point of view and the ones that are really uh, was uh, very uh, interested and curious about. Uh, the first one was the, the aspect of uh, the question of blame. Um, and also the, uh, the uh, or the relationship with uh, testimony, how testimony was elaborated uh, as something to get over uh, the idea of blame. I was also interested in the methodology and the preservation of sources, uh, methodology for the research. Uh, and as concerns the performances, uh, well, I, I can say that I was very uh, impressed uh, by the, the video uh, and particularly by the aspect that Miriam insisted so much on that it was not a reenactment. Uh, it was an intergenerational dialogue and uh, that the purpose was not to traumatize people. So these were the aspects uh, that caught my attention. They are not conventional uh, questions. Uh, I'd like to, well, uh, compliment all of you on the, the beautiful work, on the beautiful research, and please feel free to comment uh, on something that you have uh, or that you feel uh, relevant from the point of view of the project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, well, Will I take blame? And John, do you want to take testimonies? And okay, yeah. Maria, Sylvia, thank you so much. That that's uh, re I think what you've pointed out is what we would hope would come through. <laughs> um, for me, the question of blame, initially when the commission's report was published, it became very much the story. So the, the, the new story at the time was that it was societal blame it should be spread somewhat evenly. <laughs> and I, I suppose for me as a researcher in child welfare, I, I would take a different perspective on this. I, I wouldn't, now that was not blame being put on survivors by the report, but it was very much on families and on, on, on particularly the, the, the men who may have interacted with, with women. Um, I would probably take a more, um, socio-cultural approach where I would think that the power dynamics, as John mentioned, within Irish society would not have given uh, equal status to someone from uh, a lower class or someone who is from, you know, a particular uh, religion. And so I don't think that blame can be apportioned so, so equally. But I do think that the testimonies bring up the question of blame very regularly in an interesting way. Often that blame can be, be very much um, on a local level. So it might be a particular person. It might be, you know, it, it can be, it be, can be quite uh, a local level. And then we still see the, the narrative of, of very much um, the Catholic church in particular, but also the Protestant churches is coming through and, Perhaps the question of the state doesn't get as much focus sometimes in the testimonies 
Um, even uh, during the times that we're looking at or the decades we're looking at, there was some confusion as well about who was paying to uh, for the upkeep, if we can say that. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure we can, but who was paying for these institutions? And I think now we have a greater understanding that um, oversight should have come for many of them from the state. So I think that is important. But also we can see that um, for many of the families that placed and were involved in the placement of their daughters in particular, um, they may have had other ideas about how institutions operated. So I think the question of blame is really interesting and we will hopefully tease it out more. Mm -hmm. um, John, do you want to discuss the, the taking of the oral histories and the methodology? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess, um, <clears throat> I suppose um, I'm switched on, am I? I am, yes. <laughs> um, I suppose uh, the process was developed in discussions with survivors and I think it arose initially um, from dissatisfaction on the part of survivors with the way their stories were being uh, told. Uh, and that would be out of um, maybe uh, uh, interviews, media interviews, and indeed with their early um, experience of, of the commission. So we tried to develop a process in conjunction with them, uh, which would give them as much control over their stories as possible um, forever, essentially, for as long as, 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 as they are, as they are around, essentially. Uh, to, um, uh, to to edit um, uh, and, um, and add, uh, as it were. I should say, of course, that just like the performance, that the process has been uh, interrupted greatly uh, by COVID. And it's not, um, I, I, we are dealing, uh, because uh, Chewham was an early uh, closure, as it were, back in 1961, uh, the people we're dealing with are quite advanced in years, so um, it probably wouldn't be ideal in any case, uh, the um, interviewing over Zoom, uh, but um, really um, the, the, the interviews had just commenced uh, when we were required uh, to, uh, to park them. And while we have been doing community interviews with the people who've been involved as campaigners or who had other connections uh, with the institution, um, we have been we have been uh, held up, um, I suppose. Um, with regard to the, a number of issues arise, I suppose, with regard to the specifics here in relation uh, to the project. Um, Paul Thompson uh, said something about people being good for, in relation to oral history, people being good for history, but history being uh, good for people as well, in the sense that, it, um, oral history allowed people to tell their own stories, but obviously this is um, not a simple question and revisiting stories is um, can cause uh, trauma as well. And obviously we, we, we don't want to go there. So questions of um, processes of counselling and so on, um, which are easily accessible, um, has arisen. And now that in the aftermath of the commission, uh, the the state is providing um, uh, for 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 for, for counselling, which um, we hope, uh, which we will be able to, um, uh, to or, or, or our in, our interviewees will be able to uh, to 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 avail of. So um, there are um, there are some of the issues, I suppose, that uh, that that have arisen. Thank you very much, John, Miriam, and Sarah. Uh, I hand over to Alini. Thank you. Hello there. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I've had some technical problems here. My computer, my laptop has just broken down, so I had to switch to my cell phone. So I hope you can see me and hear me okay. So um, thank you so much um, for, for this paper, um, Sarah Ann, Miriam and John. I've been working with Miriam for nearly four years now, I think. So I am quite involved in some of the history of trauma and the architecture of containment in Ireland. Um, so that's been going on for a while now. 
Um, so my questions, they kind of have to do with the highly multidisciplinary nature of your project, which is fascinating. Um, and also it has to do with your, with your methodology. And um, some of the questions that I had written down, I think they have somehow have already been asked by Maria Silvia. So I'll try not to uh, be too repetitive here. Uh, so I don't know if John and Sarah Ann kind of feel that you've already answered this, you can just uh, ignore me. <laughs> or if you want to compliment and add on to what I'm asking now, uh, please feel free to do it. Um, so, um, so this part has to do with um, Sarah Ann's and John's um, take um, in the project. Uh, and it's more to do with how you've crafted your questions. So I don't know if, if you'd like to go more into detail, since we've been talking a lot about um, the problems related with triggering, triggering trauma. So how do you actually craft your questions? what is it that is actually um, important to draw out from those victims? So what were your criteria for formulating those questions? Did it change from interviewee to interviewee? Um, and this second part is actually for Miriam. I don't know if, should I split this? Would you like to answer first and then I move on to Miriam? How do you feel about this? Sure. Yeah. If you if you want, we can, will we take it first, Miriam? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's 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 lovely to see you again. <laughs> we only met once in nice person. Thing you <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I the questions we definitely don't have a set template of questions. Is what I'll say. Um, yeah. it's definitely much more an initial phone call, um, mm -hmm. a chat basically to arrange you know, where the meeting, as John said, you know, primarily it would, in an ideal world, it would be in someone's house or somewhere they're very comfortable. It would be over a cup of tea. And we try to speak as little as we can. <laughs> so it's very much, there are some factual details we do need, the years in which people were in the institution, um, you know, personal details they may want to give. But most of the interviewees, because they were children, their memories of the institution are not are not very much the story. The life stories are around how what they have learned, how they were placed in the institution and the rest of their life. So usually when they were fostered out or boarded out as the term um, and we very much are seeing them as life stories. And that's where the piece that Miriam is discussing, the intergenerational piece is really important as well, I think, um, because because the Tume Institution closed in 1961, there's there the children are now themselves older, which is really really quite interesting. So it's it's you know for us the questions themselves about the institution, it's not prescriptive. It's very much just letting people speak and share. I think what's interesting is when they read the transcript, they often would come back with additions or or change something or you know when you read it yourself or you hear it back it can trigger or it can kind of have a spark for something else but a lot of the stories are more the story of being born in that institution and your life afterwards i think if if john john you could might correct me in that <laughs> you're on mute yeah. john 2020s line. <laughs> um, experiences vary. So we try not to be prescriptive in this regard. So um, with people being boarded out <clears throat> at about seven, the memories prior to that are dim enough, in, though they do vary uh, from one person uh, to the other. So the experience of boarding out and I suppose the subsequent um, quest for identity, essentially the struggles people had um, with the state, uh, essentially, and um, <clears throat> with officialdom uh, to get the sort of information they require about their their, their origins and, and, and so on. Uh, that um, looms quite large. And that process itself tells an awful lot about Irish society 
say more recently over the past uh, 20, 30, 40 years, um, indeed, uh, as well. Um, thank you very much, John, Marianne. So now this is um, a question that I have for Miriam. So Miriam, you've um, talked a lot about, um, you know, so the stuff that you do it has to do with music and body movement. I think it was Sarah Ann who mentioned that the victims want to be represented in their own words and with some control. Um, I know you've already mentioned No Escape and how it received some negative um, criticism. But I was wondering whether you would consider or you're considering using some verbatim in the performances. Um, um, because that seems to be very important for the victims. So I don't know how much of um, words yes. you're planning to use onto your artistic creations. We are planning to use a bit. I suppose the first thing to say is any testimony that I look at, um, Sarah Ann and John and Mary have gone through a process with that survivor where they have agreed that the testimony can be used for creative work by the university. So that, I suppose that would be the first thing to say that we have permission um, for those testimonies. Some of the testimonies were also, they were captured as, or, as recordings. And so we have their voices. So for the people who have given permission for us to use them, we are going to use bits as voiceover. Um, and for many reasons, it, because it grounds it very specifically that it's about these people and it's about this institution and it's not about everything. It's not about every problem. It's not about every history. It's about this one specifically. Um, and also because there's just, we couldn't do it justice. You couldn't reenact something as powerful as when you hear them tell their story in their own words. So that will be how we bring in their voices specifically. There had been a suggestion in earlier conversations with um, the Tume Home Alliance as, as a group that a few of them might like to perform. Some of them like to play musical instruments. Some of them um, are fans of different kind of artwork. And we were totally open for that. But by the time COVID happened, there is no way we could put people in a room together. It's just too dangerous. So I can't have any direct engagement that we had been open to previously, but we will be using some of the oral recordings as voiceovers to some of the movement work the students do. Um, so that's, that's how we will keep it uh, specific, I suppose, to their experiences without it trying to say it is a representation of their experiences, which it isn't. And that would have been, I suppose, my decision as a director from the get go, that I didn't want to do a representation because I just didn't feel naturalism was the right approach in this instance. I think there'll be other instances where it is, but to do naturalism really well, to make something look realistic really well, you need a huge production budget. You need months of rehearsal time. If you're going to be dealing with violence on stage in any kind of physical or natural, naturalistic way, you need to be dealing with professional performers because these students are amazing, but they're 19, 20. And so they're, you know, trying to create the line between this as an educational experience, which is very meaningful, but an educational one versus dealing with a group of paid professional trained performers who have applied for and gotten a job to do representational violence. You know, they're separate things. And so we have to remind ourselves that this is a university project with very key pedagogical goals. Um, and the students are amazing, but I have to remember our job is the learning outcomes are about the engagement and the learning process. The, the learning art outcomes aren't about the final product being a big blockbuster about, <laughs> you know, what happened. And it's so hard to decide whose testimony you pick and make it like, who, who would you bring in and who would you cut? I wouldn't know where to begin. So we're going to take bits of the recordings um, that are there where we have been given permission and we're going to use those in the final film and we're going to have the interviews with the experts to address the
the historical issues, the political issues, the archival issues. Um, and then the main work by the drama students will be on the degree they signed up for, which is a drama degree and not a degree in psychology or social work. And I, I have to be careful of keeping that line. So I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. <laughs> and I don't know if I have time for one final question, maybe. I have loads, but you know, Laura, do I have things? We are, we are a bit delayed, but, but if okay. you want to go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just have one. It's actually a bit of a curiosity. Um, you're, you're all coming from different um, academic backgrounds. So I guess it has to do with your dynamics and um, how is it that you split um, your work and, uh, and your, your take in this huge and beautiful and important project. And I know that Bar Bar Barry is involved as well. Um, I don't know, I, I guess it has to do with, yeah, the dynamics of your work as a group of academics coming from such different backgrounds. Uh, we talk about the importance of multidisciplinary studies in academia, but very often that's not very achievable. So if you could just talk us through your dynamics, maybe, <laughs> if you want to. I thought I wanted the co-PIs to do this, John. <laughs> um, uh, we, this is, I should say, this is a low budget project where these amazing academics are giving their time, their expertise, um, uh, we, we, what I think it has shown is that NUI Galway, who I didn't think I would be doing a promotion for the university, but we, we happen to have the, just these amazing academics that go across the university. So in drama, in the archives, obviously myself and John are in history. And then we also have involvement from um, Elaine Feeney, from Mary Cunningham. Um, so we just have these, these amazing uh, academics and researchers who really want this project to work and i i think that um myself and john are not the reason the project is, is going well it's that each individual uh, is is very diligent and is um very creative you obviously know miriam so you know this so each one of them i just have huge respect for as does john and i think we're just very lucky to have a team of of just very sound, as we say in Cork, people who are putting a lot of effort and and time and a lot of themselves into work that is, you know, is, is very difficult. And also at a time during COVID-19 when everyone is working too much, everyone is, and they're working at home and there is a very little line between home and work at the moment for people. And yes, everyone is doing everything they can. So... I, I'll send them this recording, but they're an amazing group. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think I want to add anything uh, to this, yes. Um, I suppose the dynamics are different than they might otherwise have been. And I suppose initially there were uh, issues uh, because of uh, the different ways the different disciplines approach material and so on. Historians can be kind of precious sometimes. Uh, so we had to be prepared to be, um, uh, to to uh, listen to, to people essentially, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, theatre was just the usual thing where everything in the world goes against you and somehow you just managed to do it. But I don't even want to say that because tomorrow I could get an email saying you're no longer allowed to come to campus. So it's a work in progress and I'm afraid to talk about it too much in case the COVID comes for me and scares it all away. <laughs> Thank you, Miriam, John and Sarah Ann. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Alini, for those wonderful questions. I'm so sorry that I didn't have the chance to, in um, to introduce you properly. I was having issues with my, with my mic just before um, it was your turn to speak in case, um, I mean, it sounds like you have a wonderful relationship, working relationship and friendship with the people on the call, but just for people who are tuning in, um, Alini is based at the Federal University of Santa Catarina and she's a professor at the Department of Language Studies and Literature, but with a huge focus on, on theatre and she herself is a playwright, theatre director and translator, having translated, directed and acted in, in several plays, especially by Irish and, and Northern Irish um, playwrights. 
so I, I don't think there's anything else for left for me to do except for to close this session, which I think has gone on um, a, nearly half an hour over time, which I think is testament to how um, how I guess how inspirational and how interesting this uh, this content has been for for all of our listeners. I, I think we could go on and, and talk about it um, much longer, and I, I hope that there will be chances for further collaboration and exchange with with Brazil in the future. I think with um, particularly focusing on the, the interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary nature of the project, there's a lot that every university can can learn from. But then, of course, it is just a testament to the creativity and the commitment of, of all of you guys who are involved in the project and uh, ensuring that um, you can you can make the most of it for the survivors and also your extremely thoughtful approach approach, which I think is something that lots of um, similar similar projects in the future will have a lot to lot to learn from. Um, my understanding is that the project is supposed to uh, go on maybe until 2023. And as we're mentioning all the different impacts of of COVID-19 and unfortunately how it's, how it's delaying stuff, but congratulations in 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 managing to to adapt and to find ways of of keeping things going, which is all we can do at the moment. Um, and I wish you every Success again is is not the word for this type of project, but I hope that everything goes goes well in the project for everyone involved, um, and especially for the for the survivors who you have developed such such strong uh, and close relationships with. Thank you to everybody, um, and thank you to everyone who's tuned in for this session. Thank you, Jill, for chairing this session. This is really a very interesting and motivating. Uh, session for us to learn more what uh, all what you have presented to us, uh, Miriam, John, and Sarah Ann, and also through the questions that uh, Aline and uh, Maria Silvia have done to you. And um, of course, I made uh, Jill's words mine also, congratulating you. And I hope we could continue following up. Uh, what you are doing and perhaps sharing that with us and and also sharing our experience here in Brazil uh, there with